What is good, everybody? You are back with Inside Carolina, InsideCarolina.com, episode 10 of the Throwback Podcast. I am over the moon that you guys are here with us once again. We've had a lot of fun doing these so far. If you have had fun listening to them, I would ask you to stop what you're doing right now, uh, unless you're driving down a highway, which in that case is probably not safe. But stop what you're doing. Give us a review. Uh, give us a rating. Go to whether it's iTunes, Google Play, you know, Billy Bob's Podcast Mart, wherever you're picking this up from. Go give us a review and a rating and let us know what you think. If it's great, even better. If it's not, shoot me a message on Inside Carolina's message boards or, you know, shoot a message to Tommy or Buck or Ben or whomever. Let us know because if you don't like what we're doing, we want to stop doing it or we want to try to make it to where you do like it. Our goal is to produce content that you guys appreciate, want to consume ad nauseum, and especially in, you know, in this time when there's not live sports going on, we want to make sure that you guys are getting a lot out of, of what we're putting in. So today, I have the privilege of whisking us back to what was not a very close game, but was a very memorable game for many reasons for the University of North Carolina Tar Heels. And before we start kind of setting it up, I would be remiss if I did not give a thanks to somebody that's been around inside Carolina for quite some time. And that's Johnny T-Shirt, johnnytshirt.com. Hit them up. Thank them for sponsoring us and sponsoring this show and sponsoring Inside Carolina's content in general. We really appreciate them backing us, and we hope that you guys will go check them out. Uh, if you need something for Father's Day, for whatever sports get back on campus, you need some gear, hit up johnnytshirt.com. Uh, if you are an Inside Carolina Premium subscriber, use that code, get your extra 10% on top of their already banging prices, and, and you guys will be, be rolling in it in no time. But Johnny T-Shirt, johnnytshirt.com, we're big fans of theirs. So April the 6th, 2009, what's going on? Well, your North Carolina Tar Heels were absolutely steamrolling the NCAA tournament. And when I say steamrolling, they were – I think the only the second team in history and one of our panel guests who will join us here in a second is, is the stats man. So I may be stepping on his toes a little bit, but they're one of the only two teams in history to have beaten everyone in the NCAA tournament by 12 points or more. And as you'd find out very quickly, this game would be no different. Carolina returned just about everybody. I think somewhere in the upper eighties or 90% of their, their team from the year before that got shellacked by Kansas in the final four, uh, you know, Billy Packer's comment about it's over, yada, yada. His team comes into this game 33 and four. Uh, they were never lower than five in the polls at all this season. Uh, they had seven future NBA players on this roster. They were second in the NCAA in points per game, averaging just a, a hair under 90 points per game. So that should tell you how much they were able to get up and down the floor. Uh, they, had nine, they had nine games over where they scored over 100 and 16 games where they scored over 90. So this team could put the ball in the bucket quickly. And there weren't no slouch on defense either. Um, they had blown Miss, uh, Michigan State out in December. Uh, also at Ford Field, beat them by 35. I mean, just absolutely just pantsed the Spartans at that point in time. And come into this national championship game in 2009, having beaten Radford, LSU, Gonzaga, Oklahoma and Villanova so it was not by any means a bunch of cupcakes and pushovers uh, and they'd actually been tested pretty much against LSU when when Ty Lawson's toe was still a little gimpy. Michigan State on the other side uh, 31 and 6 coming into the game they had won the Big Ten regular season uh, they had been between 6 and 10 during the AP most of the season Tom Izzo's clubs as we all know really show up when when the calendar flips over to March he just has a great way of galvanizing his teams and kind of bringing that extra effort out. So they're, they're always a tough out in the tournament. And uh, they were returning 75% of their previous year's roster. So you're dealing with two teams that were relatively veteran squads. Um, Michigan State's road to the championship. They'd beaten, uh, they'd beaten Robert Morris, Southern Cal, Kansas, Louisville, and UConn. So it's three straight number one seeds they were playing uh, with this game, to, uh, or this game on the national championship evening. You're starting fives for North Carolina, Hansborough, Lawson, Ellington, Thompson, and Danny Green for Michigan State. Delvon Rowe, yes, that Delvon Rowe of Roy Williams dancing on his desk fame. Uh, Goran Sutan, Travis Walton, Kalen Lucas, and Raymar Morgan. And with that, I'd like to set up the guys that are going to be joining us for this ride as we flash back to 2009's title game. Uh, first, you know, Brian Ives are watching you. 
Uh, he is an absolute stat guru. He is a, uh, an ACC network producer and noted Ty Lawson stand. So I'm sure he's all about this game. Uh, and also, Marky Mark, Mark Armstrong, ABC 11 sports anchor. That's WTVD in the Triangle. Uh, you've seen him. Uh, if you've been in this area for any sorts of time, you've seen Mark covering any and every game that matters. Uh, he's also a, a huge ambassador for Tim Hortons and the first Canuke to ever join this podcast. So we're happy to have both these guys. Brian, how you doing? I'm good, Joey. Thank you for having me on. This was a uh, memorable time, not only for UNC, but me. I was a junior in college. I had turned 21 three weeks earlier, actually wow. the weekend of the LSU game. Uh, so I was... Uh, I was enjoying myself for uh, for much of this evening. Mark, you were 21 at that time too, right? I, yeah, you <laughs> stepped on my joke. I also <laughs> had just turned 21. Uh, but yeah, I was I was just, I, I'm now 16 years in October. I've been at ABC 11. Back then I was a fresh-faced young lad who'd only been there five years, but already had covered uh, two UNC national titles. So I thought that was going to be business as usual. <laughs> and and a lot of a lot of North Carolina fans thought the same thing. Incidentally, as we would find out later as we start digging into this game, UNC was on the most wins of any three-year stretch in their history, which I think they were 101-14 and 14 or something like that, which if you consider the long-term uh, excellence that has come out of the North Carolina basketball program, that says a lot that these three years they strung together were the best three they ever had consecutively. So uh, we'll get to that in just a little bit. Guys, when I start this game, or when I start the, the show, I always try to set up the game and, I, and I ask the panelists, I'm like, all right, what was your memory of the game before we rewatched it? Mark, I'll go to you first. What, what, was, what was your memory of this 2009 title game before we went back and looked at it again? I, I, I re, well, I, mean, I just remember the decimation. I remember how quickly and suddenly it was over and how quickly the entire huge crowd that we'd talked so much about that was going to be almost entirely Michigan State fans, how, I mean, they were just knocked out of the box immediately. Um, and there was one basket that I specifically remember where I was like, that's it, game over. <laughs> and so on the rewatch, I wasn't exactly sure when that bucket occurred. For some reason, I had in my head a score, and I ended up, you know, on the rewatch watching it, and I was not even close. And it was way earlier than I remember <laughs> watching the game live, how quickly I was saying to myself, all right, it's over. It was uh, – you're exactly right about it taking the very partisan – Michigan State Ford Field crowd out of there. Uh, at the time, it was a it was an attendance record for the NCAA championship game of seventy two thousand nine hundred twenty two people, and the folks in green were sad very soon. Brian, what was your what was your read on this game in your memory banks as a young spry, welcome, yeah. fresh faced, newly tapping into the world of alcohol? I assume mm -hmm. uh, at twenty one years old, what did you remember about the game then? For, for the so, first time, I'm mean, yeah, yes, obviously. Yes. Cheers. <laughs> Uh, so for, so back then we were all every game, like that UNC played, if some team got within like double, single digits, fans just freaked out. It was just a different level of um, confidence, a different level of paranoia. So my memory is, is bizarre. Yeah. So I think, um, Deion Thompson, as he seemed to do a lot that year, scored the first bucket of the game, put Carolina up 2-0. Then Goran Sutan came down and hit a three from the top of the key. They give Michigan State the lead, and the crowd – I mean, that's prop had to have been the loudest it was the entire game. <laughs> and, like, I was like, oh, no, oh, no. But like, this guy's going to start making threes. He had, like – he's, like, only attempted five shots the game before. And I was like, oh, and Sutan's going to start making threes. He's going to have a queer game. We're, we're doomed. And uh, so that was the pessimist in me. That was like, oh, we're in trouble. But I just remember how loud the crowd was on the second possession of the game and looking back at how that was, like, the only time that the crowd was whatsoever a factor in that game. I remember that Sutan bucket because I wrote it down in my game notes. Uh, and Michigan State took a three to two lead and we're off, right? Um, it would come back later and the score would be much, much different and, and very sad for, for Sparty. Guys, the, the, the flow of this game was almost non-existent because as, as Mark said earlier, it got out of hand so quick. Brian, I'll go to you first. Because this is such a this is such a different feeling game, yeah, you know, we're probably not going to run this podcast the way we typically have, but I'm going to try to. Major events of the game, like I hate to jump this far ahead early, but at what point in the first half did you realize, oh, oh, this is what we're getting out of North Carolina tonight? Yeah, um, 
it was also a terrible flow of the game because I think it set a title game record for combined free throws. Um, yes. That didn't help the flow. Um, but uh, mine, the, when I was like, okay, this is about to get out of hand, it was a um, Hansbro pass into Deion Thompson who went over his, I guess, left shoulder and scored an and one. I think it made it like 28 to 11 or something like that around there. And, uh, and he, and he kind of daps up hands right after that. That's when I was like, all right, this game, uh, I just remember that because yeah, the CBS had a nice tight shot, slow mo shot of uh, Thompson celebrating. Um, and that, that, that was sort of the, the point in the game was like, I was like, all right, like this, that's probably about it for, for, the, for the competition standpoint and the concern standpoint. You had amped up Tyler Hansborough following in again after you mentioned uh, his dish into to Thompson, who had again finished through contact. I had in my notes just how active Deion Thompson was during this mm-hmm. game, so I'm, I'm glad you you lifted that up early. Mark, when did you realize that it was all over but the singing? Well, yeah, so that goes back to what I was saying earlier. I have this like crystal clear memory of Wayne Ellington curling off like a baseline, the left wing catching twisting, firing all in like one motion and just drilling it. And I had in my head for some reason, and I don't know why this is, that it was 42-28 at that point uh, in my memory before I rewatched it. And then I watched the game and it was 15 to five. (laughs) 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 And I was like, but I remember it because I had a great, I had snake day. One of the great sporting events of the final four is when your local TV guy is trying to snake a courtside seat instead of being punted away (laughs) with the local you guys so I had snaked a great courtside seat and I just remember watching Wayne I was like because the the, the thing we always talk about too when they they play the games in these huge stadiums is you wonder how well these guys are going to be able to shoot the ball and Carolina just came out and was just dropping everything they were shooting and you're like yeah I mean Michigan State needed Carolina to be cold to even have a shot based on what we saw from that December game to even stay in the game and Carolina just came out and said you no, you're not getting any chance to and that Wayne Ellington shot did it for him. It wasn't Shimon Williams against Utah, was it, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> no. For, the, <laughs> for those of you that's keeping score more. at home, that's uh, yes, Mark cool. Thomas, yeah. noted Utah fan uh, here in the triangle. And, and Brian has already thrown the gloves <laughs> off and requested that they dance uh, at, the, at, the, at the center circle. Uh, well, Shimon has good company with Michael Dickerson of Arizona when uh, – uh, Rick Majerus, but the the box and one and let him shoot air balls. I think he was over <laughs> in the regional you, final against the. You you mentioned uh, Joey. Sorry, I can get you off path. But you mentioned you mentioned Ellington. He was eight of ten from three in that final four. Uh, that's a NCAA tournament final four record for one final four. Second place in that list actually is Donald Williams, who uh, was <laughs> ten of fourteen in ninety three. So two domes, two Tar Heels, two. Uh, they were good. They were good players in those teams, but I wouldn't think anyone considers those players the two best players on those teams. Um, maybe Donald Williams, but uh, just interesting that those two guys just lit up two domes for for titles. For both of those guys to to tail to tailgate on that, Brian. Both of those guys ended up with the uh, MOP of their respective Final Fours mm-hmm. as well. Uh, to to what Mark was saying, yeah, UNC came out just guns ablazing. They they went six of seven in the first segment, and all five starters scored. And you heard Clark Kellogg say it when we went back and rewatched this, that Michigan State needed some help, right? And, and Mark, you, you absolutely hit the nail on the head. Michigan State needed some help. They did not need a North Carolina buzzsaw to come out. And, you know, at, at 13.57 in the first, they got a, got a really tight shot of the bench. And this is a team that had been playing lots of players. I think Michigan State typically went, you know, 11 or 12 deep. You look on the bench, and every guy on that bench just looked gassed. And we're at the 1357 mark, right? So, you know, I, I, I know we're all pillars of, of cardiovascular fitness, but just seeing those guys at that point already be that tired, knowing how deep that they played was, was tough to see. Um, well, mentally demoralized, I too. Like, because what happened in December was really, I think, <laughs> set stage for what we saw then in April is that it didn't take much for the Tar Heels to just knock that whole pile of Michigan State blocks over mentally and physically. And, and, and you don't want to speak for Michigan State, but like UNC was a clear favorite in that game. But yeah. locally, all the – like they had to be feeling it. Like just what going everywhere, they're the team. It's sort of a weird situation where the underdog might have felt more 
ten, more tense and more more pressure on them than the clear favorite. Yeah, the sure. whole, whole narrative of the whole Final Four was we're in the recession, right? And Detroit is getting absolutely <laughs> hammered. How Michigan State was going to single-handedly pull Detroit up by its bootstraps and give it hope and give it some life and some verve again. I mean, I remember uh, one of my colleagues at the time, Kareth Burke, who's now the Warriors sideline reporter, she went out and did a story showing like rusted out children's parks and like <laughs> really um, thick. And then, so yeah, so of 72,000 people, maybe 65,000 of them are all, you know, going to roar the Spartans to this improbable victory. And then they just got slapped across the face. That's, that's exactly right, Mark. I, I, I had forgotten and I was going to ask about kind of some major events of the game, but I think you're probably leading into a really good one in that it was the hype that was surrounding this. Uh, Brian, to your, to your point about Michigan State potentially being tight, I was mentioned during the broadcast that they had shown the team a version of one shining moment with them uh, having, having won the game, which, you know, it's, it's always easy to second guess a coach's motivational tactics in hindsight. But uh, Mark, you, do you remember – any, uh, you know, you gave that great anecdote about what Kareth did, but do you remember any of the, the stuff that you got from dialogue with players and coaches about this UNC versus the economy or, you know, or Michigan, <laughs> St Michigan State fighting well, for the free world? Do you remember any of that stuff? Yeah, it, was, it wasn't something where the Carolina was being cast as the villain, certainly, <laughs> but it was a rocky story of sorts. That's the wrong city, not Detroit, but, um, um, but it was, that's the way it was. It was a little bit of David Goliath. And then you had the whole social element to it of, you know, the economy being cratered and Detroit being a hit, especially hard in the auto industry and all that stuff. So yeah, I mean, that was the overarching narrative of the game. Everybody in King Carolina was better. When you, even when you say the names of the starters, yeah, Michigan State had no business. Like, how is that a team that's in the national title game with those players but um, versus the talent that UNC was rolling out there? But I just remember that. That's certainly the tale that all the local Detroit stations in Flint, Michigan, and Lansing that were all in town to cover the Spartans. That was, that was the tale that they were weaving. And after Michigan State beat a UConn team that I think a lot of fans locally were more worried about than Michigan State. Uh, UConn, I mean, I think UConn, uh, Stanley Robinson, if I remember, led that team, um, was, was, was seen as maybe a bigger threat to Carolina than Michigan State. And probably a lot of that was from what happened early in the season. But, um, but especially after they beat UConn, like, all right, this team might be a team of destiny, if you will. And yeah, had... yeah. And it's like, well, they're summoning all these powers, like yeah. every behind them, and, and, and we're rematching. And just on this one night – for 40 minutes, maybe some magic will happen and it'll be a tale that they tell for generations, you know. It was, it was just not to be. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I, I want to get you guys' opinion on, it, it, you, you want to talk about how clicking or how fluid or how consistent North Carolina was on offense. And it did feel like they were just, you know, you know throwing punch after punch after punch after punch. I think North Carolina's defense absolutely smothered Michigan State during that first half, specifically around the uh, – between, like, that first TV timeout around 16 and then down to about the, you know, the 10 to 8 mark. I feel like Michigan State just lost their, lost their way, specifically going back and watching. There's a play that Michigan State liked to run. It's their ISO 3. They call it chest. That's, that's Tom Izzo's actual you know, name for the play where – they will run the five man up to in between the in between the free throw line and the top of the key, and they'll take both of their uh, both of their their wings or both of their their guards up top and have them essentially dive. And the way that works is they cross under the basket and they go out and usually Michigan State will usually and they run this all the time. They they did it probably seven or eight times in this game. But the way that works is if the defense uh, it's predicated on the defense not being able to guard that five man to start the flow of the play. And North Carolina, whether it was with Hansborough or whether it was with Deion Thompson sometimes or Ed Davis, they would always push their five-man or their post player up to stifle that play before it even started. So even when the guys made their dives to the wings, there was no way that they were going to get a clean look. Um, and I think that was a good example of UNC really kind of choking out what Michigan State wanted to do offensively. Brian, do you remember any specifics from this rewatch where you were really just kind of taken aback by UNC's defense? Um. I do remember Ed Davis getting up 
and blocking a shot, and it looked like his elbow was at the backboard. Um, I remember that very well. Also, obvious, I mean, the obvious everyone can say is Ty Lawson. Um, he had, what, seven, eight steals? Eight steals. Um, most, eight steals. Had, broke, it, broke the record in the first half. Um, interesting, like, that's um, – if you look back at the Ford Field game, I believe he had seven steals in that game, in the first game. So, he had 15 steals in two games against Michigan State. And his – he wasn't going against the slouch. Kalen Lucas was the Big Ten player of the year, Yeah. Um, the opposing point guard. Two games against Ty, he averaged 10 points a game and shot 6 of 22 and had eight turnovers. Um, so, you know, mine is sort of Ty Lawson. Just, I mean, a lot of times he was in the right place, right time, but 15 steals and two games against a, against a team that's headed by the Big Ten player of the year, that's really what stood out to me on, on defense. It was 21 turnovers. I mean, that's that's – if you're going to turn a team over 21 times in a national title game, you, you won't lose. There, there's, yeah. not a, there's not a lot good to talk about for, for Michigan State with regard to that. Mark, what do you got? No, I was just going to say, I, I, one other thing I'll never forget. I don't think I've ever looked at a – got one of the – maybe the under 12 out of the under 8 out in the second half, and I've never seen a stat like this before. Where there had been eight steals in the game total, all yeah. eight of them by – Yeah. I mean, how insane is that? I don't think I'll ever see it that like that. I mean, I've got guys that are getting two thirds of their team's rebounds or something like that, but to have all eight steals for both teams in a title game, crazy. Well, especially at Ford Field, the home fans at Ford Field aren't used to seeing anybody get that many takeaways. Uh, at least not for, not not for the Lions anyway. Sorry. I, I read the that the Lions just... didn't. I read the Lions didn't win a game at Ford Field that year either. So like, <laughs> so the home team fans that were coming to Ford Field that year. Uh, rough go over there. That's, that's, that's some bad mojo. So, <laughs> at one point in the first half, UNC is up twenty. It's thirty-one to eleven. So, do the math. That's a um, that's a twenty-nine to eight run uh, before the ten-minute mark in the first half. I feel After like Gordon, uh, taking the game by its neck early, yes. three to two. When when the <laughs> the large the large man from Michigan State's post just reached out and took everything this game would give him. And and then some. Oh, he's no Hano Medela. Wow. <laughs> oh, so we will not be looking at the 1998 Final Four on the throwback anytime soon. You're, um, not, you're not on the callback list, Mark. <laughs> so, guys, the you know UNC was in the bonus by the 10 minute mark in the in the first half, and this is I think I can't remember who mentioned earlier. It may have, it may have been you, Brian, about just how many foul shots this game ended up taking, and the second half really got brutal. Um, Kalen Lucas felt like all that Michigan State had. With with a game like this kind of getting out of hand, I always try to look for, like, controversies. Did you guys see anything in this game that was remotely controversial? Um, well, it was Clark Kellogg's first time calling a title game. So there Without was no Billy, Billy Packer. Packer. Yep. So that that was different. Um, I remember being struck by – Clark doesn't even look at the, the court actually he's only he, he sits courtside and watches the monitor because that's what he's essentially commenting on and that's probably not all that unusual but for some reason when I first saw that I thought that was the weird thing that you are right at center court of a national title game you're not even looking at the court yeah that makes you wonder why they put him at that place if he's not going to look at the monitor I mean he's not going like to look at the game right each person could be sitting in that seat for example just absolutely <laughs> <laughs> They called a foul, I think, on Hansbro boxing someone out. That was yeah. pretty terrible. Um, I think when uh, was it Morgan who got hit in the face uh, by Danny Green, maybe, yes. and he was down and like. Down but for other a while. than that, like I don't think there was really much that was too controversial in that game. Um, I had to I guess, go back uh, and look. Uh, I had to go back and look. I'm sorry to step on you, Brian. I had to go back and look. Tom O'Neill. Curtis Shaw and Tony Green were the three officials for this mm -hmm, game. Mm -hmm. And I, I've always, you know, coming from a trying to be as objective as you can, if you don't know the officials' names, chances are they probably did a decent job. Yes. Carl Hess was a semifinal official. I don't know which game, but I think he was. He didn't get the call up for the, for the title <laughs> game. He wasn't in this one. All right, guys. So the e easiest problem – well, maybe it's not easiest because, you know, we've done blowouts here on the throwback before. They've been really fun for UNC fans to listen to, and I'm sure this will probably – kind of add on to that a little bit but 
What was your timeless highlight? Mark, I'll go to you first. I mean, you mentioned, you know, one of Wayne's incredibly silky quick release threes that he had early in the game that w was part of UNC throttling. But do you, do you guys have a, a timeless highlight that you want to share with us? I mean, just picking, just picking one, that was the Ellington shot was the one for me. But I also have a memory that Brian referenced earlier of, of Ed Davis going up in front of his own rim and it like his armpits seemed to be at rim level. And then that long arm of his extending, I mean, it just was such a perfect picture of how out of its depth Michigan State was <laughs> that this, that like Carolina is bringing this guy off the bench to just swallow them whole as well, you know? Um, so yeah, th I, those are probably my two right there. And then, and as you mentioned right at the beginning, I just, Deion Thompson was just unbelievable right out of the gate in this one. Uh, it's, and, it's funny when you have Deion Thompson as the fifth offensive option and in the first half, it's, it was just obvious that, uh, you know, that Michigan State had nothing for him. Brian, what was your timeless highlight? Um, my time, well, the Dion, I mean, Ed Davis having 11 and 8 and Delvon Rowe having two points in that game. Uh, that's, that's some deep dive message board fodder right there. <laughs> I'm sure Roy enjoyed that. Um, but my timeless highlight is, was probably, it sort of summed up the whole game. Um, it was the last bucket of the half for North, first half for North Carolina. Off a loss and steal, he throws it ahead to Ellington, who scores to give North Carolina the most points ever in the first half of a title game, I think 55 or whatever it was. Um, so it sort of summed everything up. It summed up tie loss and steals. Wayne Ellington was the most outstanding player. Um, just the, blow, the nature of the blowout, setting the record for most points in the first half. That play probably um, – and Nance narrated it very well, saying there's the record, whatever he said, uh, a record for a first half. Um, so I think that sort of summed up the game in, in, in one play. I found myself re-watching this, wanting to see how many records that North Carolina would get. And this game has been over for 11 years. And I'm sitting here watching, wanting to see how many records Carolina would get. The Lawson's, uh, Lawson's steal record, the points and a half. I mean, it, it really was that kind of situation where it was like, God, they, they, could they really name the score here? Um, there's a part in the show that I like to do on every episode where I, I kind of spoof on John Gruden's NFL analysis, but I always like to ask, you know, the panelists like, all right, who was your, this guy for the game? You know, this guy does blah, 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 or here's a guy that blah, blah, blah. Brian, who was your, this guy for the game and, and why? Uh, I mean, it's, it's Todd awesome. Um, I, I think, I think he, uh, much, much akin to one Kennedy Meeks, I think he might've been deserving of a Final Four MOP and did not get a Final Four MOP. Um, Lawson, in addition to the steals and the defense on Kalen Lucas already hit on, he was 15 of 18 from the free throw line. Um, that's the second most free throw makes in the history of a title game. Uh, the only one ever make more was Gail Goodrich for UCLA, the Hall of Famer, in uh, 1965. So not only did he dominate defensively, Kalen Lucas couldn't handle him on offense. Um, he symbolized what was so good about that team. I think many people have said this, you know, debate who's Felton or Lawson or Ford, whatever. But as an individual season, I think that capped off probably the greatest individual season by point guard in, in North Carolina history. Um, it was just a spectacular performance all around by him. He really came into his own. And if you can say that for a guy that, you know, that was – uh, ACC player of the year, player of the year yeah. but, I mean it's he really came into his own uh as soon as March turned over you know you, that playing through the injury against Duke and and then what he was able to do in the NCAA tournament was was nothing short of uh, of remarkable Mark who was your this guy uh, I mean I I'm I'm not trying to go the easy route but it was Ty Lawson I I mean the only guy and I'm, maybe this is not the place to put this view out there, but Zion Williamson is the most incredible guy I've watched in person. Sure. Got here, yeah. but easily my second favorite player I've ever watched and covered here in the Triangle because he was the guy. I, I can remember it when Duke won in '15. Justice Winslow was the guy. Like no other team has this guy. Yeah, and nobody had Ty Lock. And when Carolina was a little bit wobbly against LSU in the, in the second round, it was a and filthy crossover bucket that just earned that game when he was still on a bit of a, a bum toe, like you mentioned. I mean, he just – he was the guy that Carolina had that was the engine and that no one had any for when he was on. 
it was it's crazy it's crazy to me that arguably the best player in the history of the program Tyler Hansbrough doesn't really have a moment in this game I think his moment is maybe him hugging Roy at the end of the game like he just it, yeah. that's how good this team that's how good this team was that the best player the statistically statistically the best player in program history and arguably ACC history didn't really have a standout moment in his national championship game. Um, that's how good this team is. Same with Danny Green, who ended up having the best NBA career of anybody in this group. Uh, he had some great moments, but he also doesn't have the moment. You're like, oh, that guy. To me, it was, it was just the loss in the Ellington show. Absolutely. And, and you know, that, that backcourt was – when they were on, they were a, just another level of good. And, again, that – what does that do? That allows guys like, like Green and, and Hansbro – and Deion Thompson to operate with, you know, absolute free reign. Uh, and, and you saw that a lot in this game. I, yeah, I don't argue at all with Wayne getting the most outstanding player, but I would have liked to have seen, you know, seen Lawson get that too. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And to your point, you know, they were getting contributions from Ed Davis, getting contributions from, uh, I mean, honestly, my timeless highlight was Bobby Fraser. You know, yeah. the amount of minutes that he played getting a run out with a few minutes left. Um, uh, again, that was that was incredibly refreshing, and I think that that sort of that sort of kind of embodied how deep and how talented this team was. That a guy like Danny Green, that's won that uh, has won NBA championships, uh, you know, had six points in this game, and, and UNC didn't feel that that loss whatsoever. Um, all right, last little section before we start to head home because I know Mark's got Mark's got fans. I think it's a it's a young Michael Doliak running around in there. <laughs> um, that's uh, I always try to ask too, when you rewatch this, you know, did it put you in your feelings? And if so, what were those feelings? Uh, Mark, I'll go with you first. Um, just, I, I just think it's so cool. I was still kind of, I mean, I'm five years into the job, but I, I started in October of 04 and immediately covered Gills winning the 05 title in St. Louis. Um, and, then, and then there's the San Antonio in 08, the Kansas semifinal craziness. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the very next year I'm back in Detroit at another. So I was just like, this is the greatest <laughs> job. And, and I'm always, it seems uh, with rare occasion, I'm covering the team that's winning the games and I'm going into a happy locker room afterwards. And I'm seeing Tyler Hansbro who returned for his senior season against all odds, getting the payoff that he so desperately wanted. So, I mean, that's the great part of the job. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to go into losing locker rooms sometimes too, and hear the explanations and the emotions, but it's just fun to see those kids at the peak time of their life. And, uh, and you're with them. You're kind of in this little microwave with them for, you know, three weeks. So you feel like you're, you're, you're definitely a, a second cousin twice removed, but you're part <laughs> of the little bit, no matter which team you're with, because you're around everybody and you've told every story we're, we're, you know, related to the team for like, you know, the better part of a month. So that's the joy of it for me. And that's just what I remember feeling like, how cool is this that I get to be here at court level watching this? It's like, I, I felt like I was living the dream. Yeah. What about you, Brian? You think you were living the dream. So I so the second half, I wasn't feeling much of anything to be quite <laughs> frankly, to be quite frank. But I, I remember just like, I knew there were some legacy things with this. Like this is an all timer right here, but I was like, I'll figure that out later. Mine was more just like, so this is, this was the what? This was the fourth. Um, yeah. This was the fourth or fifth? Fifth. fifth this was the fifth, title. yeah. Boy, this was the fifth title. And yeah. I was like, and I was like, holy smokes, I am in school for this. Like, I, there's only been five of these. I mean, five's a lot, but the, like, it's not every, only five times has, have a, the student body at UNC been able to celebrate this at that time and all together. And I remember sort of like uh, I, the whole Franklin Street thing and everything, just sort of, sort of sitting there and watching. Um, I went in that, that, uh, mosh pit or whatever on Franklin Street for like 10 seconds and it's scary scary as hell you you have no control over where your body's going so yeah so I got right out of that thing and I just I went out and I remember my cousin uh volunteered to come pick me up he had been at Carolina during the um the end of the Matt Doherty era so he was like you don't realize like this is a big deal um this is like I'm so jealous of you so I just tried to appreciate it um I know a lot of times Carolina fans can take things for granted um hopefully this past season helped people not take things for granted but um I just sort of realized how how special it was to experience this while I was in school with my classmates 
Um, I remember the next night uh, I saw Deion Thompson out in the mountain. Man, dude, like he, he looked like he could, he was floating on top of the world. Just like so happy for those kids um, after the year before. So really mine was more about like what I was experiencing as a student there and, and with my classmates. Well, Mark, you and I are incredibly old. That's what I've learned from this, <laughs> from this first part of this episode. Um, and 32, reminding. give me some credit. I'm not exactly Generation Z out here. You know? All right, before we, uh, before we wrap up this portion of the show, is there anything about this game that we have not touched on that we would be absolutely out of our gourds for not mentioning? Brian? Um, how you're never going to see a team that was the best team in the country return 92% of its scoring which is what North Carolina did from 08 to 09. Yep. Set a school record wins in 36, but 36, probably the, probably the best team in the country that year, and returned 92% of its scoring and added an eventual ACC player of the year in Tyler Zeller and obviously Ed Davis. Tyler Zeller was hurt the year before a lot. But um, so I just think how unique that was to college basketball. We might see it again, actually, depending on what the one and done rule happens. Um, but just a unique, unique circumstance. Mark, anything that we just didn't touch on that you really feel like has to get in has to get in somewhere? No, the only thing I haven't said that I was thinking about that I can't remember one of you guys touched on it anyway is that the, the knock on the team was that they could score so easily that they didn't really care to play defense at the other end. But pretty much, I mean, there were little stints, four-minute stints maybe during the tournament. But all six games, I remember just – I remember talking about this in the aftermath when we were just live for the celebration on the air, just how dialed in and seemingly these players had read all the, the criticisms about how they don't play defense. They were out, like they were on a mission. They knew they could put the ball in the basket, but they were on a mission that whole tournament to prove that they could keep the other team from doing the same and the results bore that out. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, it ended up being a, a, a freaking walk in the park, 89-72, to 72, Tar Heels win, get Roy Williams' championship number two. Uh, it was the fifth for the program uh, of NCAA titles. And the second half was just – I know we didn't talk about it, but it was just so, so long, and it, it slogged, and it was painful, and we all kind of knew the outcome before it got there, but we had to play it out anyway. And I remember you know, two minutes left in the game uh, – UNC's up by, a, a, I don't know, 15 or so. And Hansborough still has that, like, uber Tyler look on his face yeah, as if it were a tie game with 30 seconds left. Um, I think that speaks to kind of what this team was about at that point in time. But I appreciate you guys joining me. I hope you've had as much fun dissecting what was really a, a one-half national title game uh, as I've enjoyed listening to you guys talk about it. Um, appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, I would like to tell our listeners – Hey, this is a good chance. If you haven't, stop. Give us a rating. Give us a review. Uh, definitely want to thank Johnny T-Shirt again for being with us. Stick around for the next part after the break. For Mark Armstrong and WTVD ABC 11, and for Brian Ives and the ACC Network and all of the things that you guys are involved with, I appreciate you joining us. Uh, for our listeners, stick around after the break. We'll be right back. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Second part of the throwback episode 10. We just got done talking with our panel about the 2009 title game. And I'm happy to bring in one of the contributors of that game, uh, national champion, 6'8", power forward from Torrance, California, all the way talking hey. to us live right now from Spain, Deion Thompson. Deion, how are you, buddy? Man, I can't complain. I'm happy, blessed, just happy to be talking to you, man. You get a chance to talk about this game very often? Uh, it comes up now and again. If somebody's watched it and they've seen it and they remembered it, I think over time we kind of get a little bit older and people forget, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, definitely. Look, I'll save you. I, I don't want to start the, the 09 versus 05. <laughs> no, no, again. it's not going to go. I don't want to go down that lane right now. Please, no, please. Look, please. I talked to Jawad and he's so quick to want to, to want to force that 05 yeah, argument. Like, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to force that, but. That's my so, big brother, man. That's my big brother. What do you remember most about this 2009 game against Michigan State? Um, it was that moment, man, that, we were working so hard to get back to from the year before, you know, uh, when we lost to Kansas in that, uh, the semifinal game. I think that's when it all started right then and there, that feeling we had after we were down 20, I guess. And then we came back, fought back and, um, in the second half, but just couldn't get there. And then coach Williams going to the game with this, with his, uh, Jayhawk sticker on, which is awesome. He's a big part of his life being there at Kansas, but it was just so much things that going around all that whole moment. So it just, it just started from there. And yeah. then, and then you saw it when everybody came back that following year, my junior year, 
uh, Tyler's senior year and, and those guys, that other class, that's when it was like, okay, I think we can do something here. Absolutely. We, we, had, the, we had the experience of, of being there before and losing and how we lost in front. And so it, it definitely was a motivation factor. I love that you mentioned the fact this was kind of the culmination of, of a couple of years worth of work. What can you share about the team's mindset once you guys got to tip off that night? Honestly, like we were just trying to have fun. <laughs> like I wasn't even think we were thinking about anything else. Like I think we were just laughing in the locker. We played some music, laughing in the locker room, just in a real chill, relaxed mood. Like wasn't very like that. You think it's very tense and, and like super focused, locked in. But we were so laid back because the run we had to get there was, you know, we was kind of we got there kind of with, with humble, hum, being humble, saying we got there with ease. So it was like we know what we got to do tonight. Let's just go take care of our business and. The rest is history. No, oh, you guys had absolutely basically just curb stomped everybody in the tournament. I mean, it's – I think it's still – we may have mentioned this in the first part of the show. You guys had essentially the the largest margin of victory of, you know, when you average in all the games of, of anybody, I think. And it may still stand right now. It was just it – was, yeah. it was night and day. Um, yeah. One of the things I want to ask you, you were really active early in this game, and I feel like it set the tone. Uh, that was something we talked yeah. about in the first half of the show. From the scouting report and kind of you guys' strategy going in, do you remember much about what your role was in the game, especially in the offensive flow? Honestly, I couldn't even tell you because I think we just play. I think one thing that Carolina basketball does is just teach you how to play the game. And I think once you get a group of guys that know how to read each other and read the game of basketball, I know I know if Ty gets the ball, that's one of the fastest dudes I've ever seen with the basketball. So I'm going to be the first trail man down and we're just going to run. And we're going to try to be in better shape than you and just try to outrun you. So, I, honestly, I couldn't even tell you what my what my strategy was or what happened the first minutes of those games. But I just think we were ready. And then I think once we got that lead, it was there was no way we were going to catch us. You guys had had beaten Michigan State pretty badly earlier in the year in the same place, and it came yeah, back to kind of that confidence again. Yeah, that's a, that's it. Like you just said, you said it even when you asked me. It's a culmination of things from the year before. And then you play the team you're going to play in the national championship game mid-season in, in St. Louis, where 2005 team won it before. So if you think about all the – how it all lines up, it kind of – it's kind of crazy, but really cool. So one of the guys in the first half uh, of, <clears throat> of our podcast mentioned that when he knew that Carolina was, you know, off to the races here, there was a play in the first half. You dropped your left shoulder, went up got fouled across the body, got the end one, and Tyler yeah, comes cool. up and, like, crazed Tyler we're fashion, so gives you a chest bump. Yeah, Do you remember so that true. play? And did, was that the one where you're like, okay, this, this is ours? Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Yeah, that was an awesome play. I mean, and when you play with Tyler, that kind of stuff just rubs off on you. You know, the dude, he, he might not say much, but just watching him play, you know he's going to bring it every single night. So those that type of energy is what you have in practice every day. And Tyler was a leader, maybe not vocally, but with his actions, which is even a bigger leader. So – by him driving us every day and then that play when he was hyped, we were all into it. It was just, it was definitely rolling. Another side note to that, a guy that I play over here in Spain, Goran Sutan. Mm -hmm. um, he was on that team. In that picture. Yeah. <laughs> he's in that picture. Yeah, yeah, that you're talking about. And um, he's a kid from Croatia, very good player, big man. Um, he's had a great European, like, career still playing today over here in, in Europe. So, and we see him, like, we just, we just laugh <laughs> about it. We always, because we have that special, that connection, because that's sure. the experience that we shared through basketball, which is, which is really cool. I had no idea. I appreciate you mentioning that. It, yeah, it really definitely. is literally a small world, huh? Yeah. Basketball, basketball definitely is, definitely is a small world. Um, so how did coach keep you guys from letting off the gas at halftime? I mean, you, you had gotten to this place where you know, you've worked so hard for a full two or three seasons, depending on how you want to look at it. And you guys yeah. are just absolutely beating the brakes off of them. How, what did he say? Because, you know, coaches always have a way of motivating his guys. What did he yeah. say to you guys at halftime? You remember? I think it was pretty easy. I think if you know basketball, if you know that team and those guys in that locker room, and what we started, started this whole conversation off about was that 2009 run. I mean, sorry, 2008 run. And, um, and how we lost it and being up. And in that game, we were down 20 at half. And I think we cut it to maybe – we definitely cut it to single, single digits. I'm not 100% sure. It could be like nine, ten, somewhere around there. So, you know, in a game of basketball, teams are going to make their run. And, like, you're in a national championship game. you you got to know that a game of basketball's runs, this team, Michigan State, is going to come out and give everything they've got. So, at that, at that kind of stuff is when that second half of the game, you really got to lock in and put it away. But that's why Coach Williams is a good leader. He reminds us, us of that, and, and, we, and we rolled with him. 
So you guys had a ton of offensive options all the way down the bench, too, on that squad. When you've got that much help, does it take any pressure off of you to be able to operate in a big game like this? Um, as a basketball player, definitely. Because you know, especially at that point in time, at the season in the national championship game, and you've been doing it all year, and then for our team, we did it the year before, you know when you're going to get in the game. You know where your shots are going to come from. You, you're prepared. And I think that's one thing that Coach Williams does for, for me like reason why I kind of got his tattoo on me, like he prepared me for more than just basketball. He prepares, prepares you for life. So he's those. So I think that's kind of how basketball and, 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 and coach Williams go hand to hand because it's bigger than basketball. It's like a life thing. So when it comes to basketball, he prepared us in the game. This is men as he prepared us for life. So much love, much love for coach. Williams. So speaking about coach, do you remember what yeah. he said to you guys in that last time out? Because at that point, you guys, it's, it's all over, it's all over <laughs> yeah, with the singing, right? Every, yeah, it's everybody. Like, you know, at that point, like, he just told us to enjoy it. Like, just take it all in. Be in that moment. Like, because you know how hard it can be to win a national championship. Like, everything has to click. Everything has to come together to win anything. Like, regardless of it's basketball or any sport, like, to, for, to win a champion, some championship at something, everything has to come together. And he just, one thing he said, he said, guys, look around. Just look at your families over there. Like, look how happy they are. And, and it was just like, enjoy it. So there's a picture of us all after we won it uh standing pointing to our family like just saying thank you and that's one thing that i'm sure coach williams and he knows it too he taught us that through that he's learned it from dean smith so um acknowledge to thank the pastor when you when you when you point at him and it's like thank our family so he definitely taught us a, a lot of things more than basketball that's a very buddhist kind of way to look at things you know, when you're <laughs> staying in the moment right and i don't you think gotta any, stay in the moment <laughs> i don't think anybody would ever picture coach williams as a buddhist not like the phil jackson but that's very much a, a buddhist mentality i i, I love mean, that that's something you've carried with you because yeah definitely like and, and like now i have that moment when you i looking at you and you're in your backdrop and you see some pictures back there like oh i know that picture or you see it and those those good memories come back and that's all we have in life is memories and you want to make some good ones absolutely so any post games, I know that last five minutes of the game was probably the, some of the longest five minutes of your life, but once you finally yeah. got to the post game, do you have any post game or locker room or, or even celebration you know, nuggets from you and some of your family that you want to share with our listeners? Um, the biggest thing I think what coach Williams did, he has this board and every, every round it gets smaller and smaller with the number that's on it. And um, before we did all our dancing around, celebrating, jumping around, throwing water, everything, he gets to the board and, and he gets to put that last that last number on there and it's a zero because it's us. We're the last team there. Mm -hmm. And that's when you go crazy again, good moments. So that was one thing that really sticks out in my head. And then obviously going back to the hotel and um in Detroit and just being with our families because it wasn't much it wasn't too many places we can go at the time. Right. Um Detroit was going through a tough time, if you remember, yeah. uh, yep. in their in their community and, and everything. So it wasn't just easy just to go everywhere. But um we made it, had a good time in the hotel. My mom was there, my, my wife, my girlfriend at the time, my wife now is there. Um, and this numbers of family members was there. So it was, it was just a good time just to be happy. And when you're winning, everybody's happy. So it was good. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to break from our format a little bit, but uh, 2009, you know, this title game, you've had a really good pro career and you've been on a lot of winning teams that have had a lot of really big moments. Can you put this in context with any of those? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's like it all goes together for sure. Um, over here, the passion for basketball is at a different level. So it, it's, it's big. It's like almost like religion. It, it really is. So when you win a championship in a, in a country, not a, let alone a state, but win a national <laughs> championship for a country, it's like, just imagine that that scale of it, how big it can be. So you definitely make great connections with people, make great memories because our season's so long. You start and you leave in August, you get home in June. I left in August and I'm still not home and it's July. So you definitely make you make good connections, you meet people, but when you win, it's it's a special thing. Yeah. All right, last thing, and I'll I'll let you go. I appreciate you giving us so much time. No, nah, man, I'll talk to you all the time. <laughs> Anytime, <man. laughs> Is there anything that you feel like that, you know? maybe we haven't touched on about that 2009 game that anybody that's, that's hearing this podcast. Just the game has alone. To hear. We're, yeah. staying in the, we're staying in the game alone. Yeah. Not outside of the minute, not outside of the span of the 40 minutes, just that game alone. I mean, just anything about that game or maybe the experience around it that you feel like anybody watching or listening to this has to know about. 
that'd be tough. I, <laughs> we're not going to talk about that right now. We're not going to answer that question. That we really want to say and answer which 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 team is the best. But um, I think one thing, if you want to think about our team, it wasn't about anything else but just winning and having fun. I think that's what makes sports, let alone basketball, very what makes it fun and what makes it enjoyable. Um, just to be in the gym and cheering on your teammates and, and trying to win a game. You got 40 minutes to win it. So I think the biggest thing, if you want to take away from our team and the, the squad that we had, is we were all individuals, but we came together as one and, and we had fun and we won and it was, it was a good time. Well, absolutely. And not only do you guys provide a, a heck of a, a video sequence and, and a lot of memories for Carolina fans, but uh, just hearing you kind of rec rec recant that and, and talk about it and share it back with everybody is it's been really fun and enjoyable. And I appreciate your willingness to open up and share yeah, with man, us. Anytime, man. Anytime. Well, I want to give a big shout out to Dion Thompson for being here, to John Siegley for producing. Uh, can't we can't forget to shout out Johnny T-shirt, our sponsor here, right on Franklin Street, JohnnyT-shirt.com. If you need gear, hit him up. I also want to thank our, our previous guests, Mark Armstrong and Brian Ives. But for Dion Thompson, I'm Joey Powell, episode ten of the Throwback. Hope you guys will continue to listen, hit us up, give us a review on uh, iTunes or Google Play or wherever, and we will catch you on the next time. Late.